Good morning, church. Happy Easter. Can you just at least give me a wave? Let me see those hands. Man, let me tell you how much I know. I miss you. The staff misses you. Pastor Trey misses you. We can come and lead worship and bring a message to you, but man, you make the church. And it is so good to see you. Six feet apart and in your car, but it's so good to see you. But regardless of that, we're still going to worship today. If you're listening from us at home or wherever you are driving, we're so glad that you are here worshiping with us on this Easter Sunday as we celebrate our risen Savior this morning. In your bulletin, you'll have the lyrics to our first worship song today, and that is Low in the Grave He Lay. This morning, man, again, it's so good to see you. And we're going to welcome Pastor Trey up now for today's welcome and prayer. Well, good morning. It is so good to see everyone this morning. I see the, the hands waving. God is so good. And listen, he is risen. He is risen indeed. And uh, we're able to gather together and worship. And the Lord even let the sun come out just a little bit for us. For this time, but it is so good, good to be here. Listen, this is a, a, a little different this morning, but uh, if you hear somebody honk their horn, uh, it's true they might be trying to get out or they might just be saying amen, okay? And so um, we'll just go with it, but it is, uh, it's such a good day to be here. Uh, if you are a newcomer, maybe you're here this, this Easter morning because you heard there was a drive-in service. Uh, we're so glad you're here, and we want to know how we can pray for you, and, uh, and we want to get in contact with you and just, just let you know how glad you, we were that you came and worshiped with us. If you received a bulletin, on the right side, there's a place where you can tear off and provide a little information about yourself. And at the end of the service, as y'all leave, 
uh, as everybody leaves the parking lot, um, there'll be a, some folks there that you can drop that in with. And church family, I want to encourage you, if, if you uh, have a prayer need this morning, I want to encourage you, we want to be praying for each other and lifting up one, one another up. I want to encourage you to write your prayer need on this little tear-off uh, sheet as well. And just drop that in the bucket at the tail end of the service. For those of you who uh, are prepared this morning to worship through giving, you can drop that at the, in the bucket as you leave at the tail end of the service too. But God is so good. Listen, I want us to go to the Lord in prayer. But before we do, I want to read this scripture. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, This says, praise the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that is imperishable, uncorrupted, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. Praise the Lord. He Jesus lives. Let's pray. Go before him in prayer this morning. Father, we thank you, God, that today we remember the truth. It is a historical truth, and yet it is also a truth that lives in each of us, that Jesus lives. You rose him from the grave, Father, almost 2,000 years ago. And he's still changing lives today. And God, we thank you. We thank you as we just read in this passage of the new birth, uh, being born again, Lord, that comes through the power of the resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ. Father, thank you for those of us who are gathered here this morning. Thank you, Lord, for those that are listening at home. And God, we just ask that you would be honored and glorified in our time. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. We're just going to continue to worship this morning. Man, I'm, it's so good to see you. I'm just going to keep saying that today. Man, all right, we're going to keep worship, worshiping today.
have some special music for you this morning that's called was it a morning like this and I can't help but think all the rain the gloom the cloudy skies and you know pastor Trey and I were talking this morning and I said I don't think I have ever had an Easter where it's been weather's like this or it's been cold or or the sun has not shown it's just any of that and Here we come to gather, and what happens? So uh, with this song today, it talks about, was it a morning like this? And I want you to listen to those lyrics this morning, and listen to the story. And this is from Mary's perspective of going to the tomb in Jerusalem this morning. Was it a morning like this, when the sun still hid from Jerusalem, and Mary rose from her bed to tend the Lord she thought was dead? Was it a morning like this, when Mary walked down from Jerusalem? the grass sing, did the earth rejoice to feel you again? Over and over like a trumpet underground, did the earth seem to pound, he is risen. Over and over like a never-ending round, he is risen. Did the earth rejoice to feel you again? Over and over like a trumpet underground, did the earth seem to pound? He is risen. Over and over in a never-ending round, he is risen. this morning. Thank you. Amen. He is to be praised this morning. And I'm excited for the rest of worship today. Are you? That's what I thought. Yeah, don't be afraid. Praise the Lord this morning. We're going to welcome Pastor Trey on up today for today's Easter message. Again, I love you. It's so good to see you. You can continue to worship with us this morning. Amen. All right. If you'll... Turn in your Bibles to uh, Luke chapter 23, Luke chapter 23, he is risen, 
Jesus is risen, and because he lives, we can live. And uh, that's why we're gathered here this morning to, to worship and to worship our risen Lord. Um, this morning, we will, of course, talk about the resurrection, that Jesus has been victorious over the grave. But before we get there, we're going to look at the story of the thief on the cross this morning. This is a redemption story. As we've been going through the past few weeks, thinking about the stories of redemption, and every one of us has a story of redemption. If you've been saved, that is, God has sought you and saved you through the cross, through Jesus Christ. So we have a redemption story. What was it like that day at the cross? The scene was one of mocking. As you know, they, they put together a crown of thorns, and they led Jesus to the cross. But even when he was put there on that hill outside the city of Jerusalem, the mocking continued. It says that those who passed by, they yelled insults. And the chief priests and the scribes were also there saying, he saved others, but he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down from that cross and we'll believe in him. It was a scene of mocking and certainly there are Many who mock Jesus today, who say that he is uh, a fairy tale of sorts. There is mocking today. Many critics of the Bible, and this applies to the passage that we'll look at this morning, so it's important we understand this before. Many critics of the Bible, without ever approaching the Bible with an open mind, but rather having a dismissive attitude from the start, they mock believers and they will accuse the account of Jesus' crucifixion of having contradictions. Before we deal with the meat of the passage that we will look at, we need to deal with one of these alleged contradictions. All four Gospels mention two criminals on the cross. Two criminals at the side of Jesus, on both sides of him. Matthew and Mark specify that both criminals taunted and mocked Jesus. But the Gospel of Luke tells us that only one mocked Jesus, and the other defended Jesus against the mocking of the other one. This is no contradiction. Just as... You can have four sports reporters, each on a different side of the football field, all reporting on the same winning play, they would catch different nuances. And so one sports reporter might be on one side and record the play, but also record the emotions of the winning coach. Another reporter may uh, be on the other side and may record and report the general disappointment of the losing team. Another reporter may report a different nuance of the game and they're all reporting the same story and they're all getting the same facts and it's all true, but they catch a different nuance. When we look at this passage that we're going to look at today, we see when we look at the Gospels together that two criminals, both on the sides of Jesus on a cross of their own, were both mocking Jesus at first, but then one had a change of heart even in those moments while he was crucified next to the Lord. And that one changed his viewpoint about Jesus Christ and was saved that very day. And so we'll read the text in Luke 23, 
verses 32 through 43. It says two others, criminals, were also led away to be executed with Jesus. When they arrived at the place called the Skull, they crucified him there along with the criminals, one on the right and one on the left. And then Jesus said, Father, forgive them because they do not know what they are doing. And they divided his clothes and cast lots. The people stood watching, and even the leaders kept scoffing, saying, He saved others, let him save himself, if this is God's Messiah, the Chosen One. And the soldiers also mocked him. They came offering him sour wine and said, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. An inscription was above him, saying, This is the king of the Jews. Then one of the criminals hanging there began to yell insults at him, saying, Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other answered, rebuking him, Don't you even fear God, since you are undergoing the same punishment? We are punished justly, because we're getting back what we deserve for the things that we did. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, I assure you, today you will be with me in paradise. Let's pray. Father, thank you, Lord, for this this story of redemption. And God, I pray that you help us to understand this story and to see, Lord, the incredible love that you have for all who would trust in you, God. Lord, thank you. We ask your blessing on our time, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. They led Jesus to a hill outside the city walls of Jerusalem, the hills known as Golgotha, the place of the skull. And they placed him between two criminals, The spectacle of crucifixion, it was meant to be a spectacle so that when people drove by, they would see what happens to those who are criminals who commit crime against Rome. It was a slow death as the person had to, the person on the cross would have to lift himself up in order to draw each breath. And this required the person on the cross to put continual pressure upon the places where the nails were driven through his wrists and his ankles. And eventually, through exhaustion, the person on the cross would die from suffocation. It was this moment where these two thieves and Jesus were on the cross, three crosses on this hill, It was this moment that provided a sobering thought to the one criminal who trusted in Christ later. Death brought about a sobering moment to the one thief. He answered in verse 40, he said, Don't you fear God since you are undergoing the same punishment? The one thief spoke to the other and said, Don't you realize that we're about to die? In that moment, the reality had sunk into the heart and mind of the one thief at this time. And we see in this passage that the one thief, by the grace of God, two things happened. He turned from his sin and he trusted in Jesus as his Lord and Savior. And that's the gospel. The gospel message is that any one of us can turn from our sin and trust in Jesus Christ. And those are our two points to consider this morning. Jesus was there on the cross, and as the one thief saw Jesus die on that cross, he turned from his sin. He had heard that Jesus was innocent, no doubt. 
Pilate had told everyone that this man, Jesus, was innocent. Why would we crucify him? But as he saw him, he recognized the innocence of Jesus. In our passage, you notice what he said down in verse 41. He said, we are punished justly because we're getting back what we deserve, but this man has done nothing wrong. It is said that what comes out of us when we're squeezed is the real us. When you squeeze an orange, orange juice comes out. If you squeeze a lemon, lemon juice comes out. And here, if you think about it, these three were up on the cross in excruciating pain. Excruciating, that word, of course, comes from the root word for crucifix, excruciating pain, truly. And as Jesus was squeezed in that moment, this one thief observed that what came out of Jesus was not cursing like the other thief, or like both of them at one point, both of the thieves. But what came out of Jesus was love. And he said, Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He witnessed the innocence and the love of God. And what came out of Jesus in this moment in his humanity as he was squeezed was compassion for those around him. And the thief realized that this man was not the same as himself and the other thief, that this man, Jesus, truly was innocent. And this caused something to happen in the heart of this thief. And he turned from his sin. The Bible calls that repentance. When, we, uh, when we're trying to get out of tr trouble, and many of you know what this is like, those of you who have children, or all of us have been, have been a child at one time, and there's a few tactics we can take to try to get out of trouble if we realize that we are suffering or will likely suffer consequences for something we've done wrong. One, we can try to just deny it, deny what we've done. But this thief didn't do that. He recognized, we see in verse 41, that he was there on the cross for the things that he did. He recognized that he had sinned. He didn't deny it. We could also um, try to minimize the punishment by hiding. There's no way that this thief could hide. He was nailed to the cross. There was no escape. And he realized in that moment that on the other side of death, greater punishment awaited for him, and there was no way to hide from the God that he would answer to. He couldn't hide. Other times, we can try to minimize our punishment, and we've all tried this as children. We try to suck up in some way to try to make it better. And yet, this thief's hands and feet were nailed to the cross. There was nothing that he could do to make his situation better. Or we try another strategy. I, I, uh, I don't know what to call this strategy, but certainly an attempt to minimize uh, punishment. When I was younger, I have a, a memory of my younger brother. I have two younger brothers. My brother Garrett, on the way home from church after he was acting up that day, which we all did at times. But Dad said that when when we got home, when he got home, Garrett would get a spanking. And so when we got home, we had where we parked our vehicle down to where our house was, was 61 stairs on the side of the, of the hill, the mountain where we lived. And as we got home, Garrett ran down the stairs and he put all the pairs of sweatpants on that he could. And then dad, of course, followed through on his promise to provide a whipping and once he learned of Garrett's strategy, it turned out worse for him in the end. But we try all these uh, efforts to try to minimize the punishment, but this thief in this moment of, of repentance did not try to do that. He didn't try to deny what he had done. He said, we have done these things. And he recognized 
if you see in verse 41, he recognized the justice of his own cross. There he was, nailed on a cross, but he said, we, to the other thief, he said, we are getting what we deserve. But this man, Jesus, he's done nothing wrong. He recognized the justice of what he was receiving. Repentance usually shows itself in a change of action. And yet notice that this thief really had very little that he could do. Nailed to the cross. Nailed to a cross next to the cross of Jesus. But see, repentance doesn't really have to do ultimately with your actions. It shows itself in actions, but repentance is first and foremost a change of mind where we admit to God that we are sinful and we truly believe that we have offended God. It's not just being sorry for our consequences, but it's recognizing that our sin is an offense before Almighty God. And it always leads to a change of action. Even though this thief was nailed to a cross, even though his life was in its final moments, he stopped his cursing and mocking of Jesus. As you, re you recall from the other Gospels, we see that at first, both of the criminals were hurling insults at Jesus Christ. But this one, after he saw the way this Son of God, the way Jesus was dying, his heart changed and he repented. And he no longer mocked the Lord. He quit cursing the Lord like the other thief. And he trusted in Jesus. He trusted in Jesus. This is a picture of faith. The reason I phrase it in terms of trusting in Jesus is because in our day, faith means little more than positive thinking. People think, just have faith, just believe, just, just have faith that things will get better for you. Listen, that is nothing more than positive thinking. And you can think positively all you want, but bad things will still come our way in this life. Faith, if that's all that is meant by faith, faith like that is worthless but this person's faith, this thief's faith was not mere positive thinking because his faith had an object. He trusted in Jesus Christ in this moment. This is seen in the way he asked Jesus. He said, remember me when you enter your kingdom. A couple things that this thief believed in this time. One, he he realized that this wasn't the end. There he was dying on the cross, and yet he knew in that moment that this was not the end, that there was life or eternal death after physical death. He recognized that it wasn't the end. And he said, remember me when you come in to your kingdom. He knew he was going to die physically that day on the cross. The Romans were very good at killing people on the cross. History only tells us of one instance where somebody actually survived a crucifixion. And that was only because the person was taken off early in order to save his life. So this thief knew he was going to die, but he, he realized and believed that this was not the end, that this life is not all there is. And he said, remember me when you come into your kingdom, Jesus. He also recognized Jesus as king. Do you see that? Where he says, remember me when you come into your kingdom. All the people around him were mocking him as calling him, oh, you're the king of the Jews. Oh, if you're the king, save yourself. But this thief, in seeing Jesus die, recognized him as the king and said, remember me when you come into your kingdom, Jesus. Remember me. He recognized Jesus as king. But you know, he also realized that Jesus was on the cross on purpose. Think about this with me for a moment. 
What I'm saying is that Jesus chose to be there. That this didn't happen by accident. That he wasn't, he was an innocent man, but he was not an innocent man that was a victim that was put there on accident. Certainly, certainly people were wrong to put him on the cross. But ultimately, God, the Father and God the Son, allowed and actually planned for him to be there. He chose to be there. Jesus was there on purpose. The mocking was, if you're king, take yourself off the cross. If you're the king of the Jews, save yourself. But that thief, on his own cross, experiencing that own pain that he was on, knowing that he was there justly for the crimes that he had committed, looked over and he saw Jesus on his cross. And think of all the things that that thief heard out of Jesus' mouth. He heard Jesus cry out in his, one of his last things that Jesus said. He said, it is finished. And the thief heard him proclaim in a shout of triumph that he had accomplished the mission that Jesus had done it. He heard Jesus uh, attest before his father and before those who were listening that he was there on purpose, that he was accomplishing the will of God and that in dying he, was, he could say, it is finished, I've done it. And so the thief understood that Jesus was there on purpose. Who would choose a cross? Who would choose a cross? Don't you think, even in the midst of that excruciating pain that the thief on the cross that was experiencing all this pain, a slow death, don't you think that he thought, who would choose this? Who would choose this pain? You see, more than anything else, if there's anything we can hear on this Resurrection Sunday, because we know how the story ends. But we also recognize what Jesus went through. And if there's anything we can, we can be reminded of, it's this, it's, is that Jesus loves us. And as simple and as cliche as that is, when you look at the cross and you remember what Jesus went through, the reality is this should put us in awe of the love of God. You see, the message is not that the father lost his son. It's that the father gave his son. The message is not that Jesus lost his life, but that Jesus gave his life. He laid down his life. He was there on purpose. You remember the time when they came to betray Jesus, and Peter drew his sword, and Jesus rebuked Peter. And he said, Peter, don't you know I could, I could call down 12 legions of angels to stop this? But he said, put your sword back up, Peter. He chose to go on to the cross. And we've heard this message, and chances are you've heard this message many times. But when we realize that we are really not much different than the thief, and if we can realize that because of our sin, we deserve death, and we deserve to be nailed to a cross, not only for a time, but eternal death, we can be in awe of the one who came and died for us. You see, the fact that Jesus chose to be there, that God was willing to do this, Puts us in awe of the love of God. I have a, I have a T Rex right here, and this is a special T Rex in my family. This is Levi's, and a couple years ago he had just gotten this, and I'll tell you why it's so special in our family. I think I'll keep this T-Rex even if he'll let me. I'll keep it forever. There was a couple years ago, and we had gotten a, a 
it was around their birthdays, and we got a gift for both Emma and Levi. Emma got this doll bed, and she was so excited about this doll bed. And we, we gave it to her, and her face lit up, but then it didn't take long that day. Uh, we all have bad days sometimes, don't we? But it didn't take long that day for Emma's attitude to go south. I asked her if I, should, if I could share this. But her attitude was very poor, and I told her, I opened my mouth, and I said, Emma, if you can't straighten up your attitude, you will lose your doll bed. I will take it away for good. It broke my heart when her attitude continued to be poor, and I was faced as a parent with the decision, do I do what I said I was going to do, or do I not? And so I took it. And the my little girl was just so upset. She was crushed. She was crying. It was, it was sad. But then comes Levi in. And Levi began interceding for her sister. And he said, please, Dad, can't she have it back? Please let her have it. I said, son, I'm sorry. I told her what would happen. And this is what I said would happen. There's nothing I can do to change it. He said, but please, Dad, please, can she have it back? And then, and as I mentioned, remember, it's the will of Jesus that he chose to sacrifice himself that makes the love of God so beautiful. As Levi was begging for his sister on her behalf, I was really faced with a predicament, what do I do? It was breaking my heart to tell my son no, and it was breaking my heart to see my daughter cry. And I said, son, would you be willing to give up your new toy so that Emma could have hers? I expected him to say no. I didn't expect him to do that. But I watched my son Levi as he went and he got his brand new T-Rex. And he took that T-Rex and he set it up on the counter. And then he grabbed that doll bed and he took it and he took it to Emma and put it in her hands. I'll never forget that day. Emma took that doll bed and she, she went into the other room and she was just quiet. And about a minute later, I went in there and she was just looking down. I said, Emma, do you realize what your brother has done for you? And she looked up with tears in her eyes and she said, yes, it's just like what Jesus did. And maybe, yes, it's a simple, it's, it's just a toy. And I did give it back later. I couldn't, after all that, hold it from them. But it's the truth that in the will, in the choice to sacrifice one's own for another, in the choice, therein we see the beautiful and the amazing love of God that he chose to be on that cross for you. And as the one thief was nailed there that day and knew that he was sinful and looked and saw the innocent son of God that chose to be there for him, I want you to know that just as Levi's act of sacrifice softened the heart of an Emma, <laughs> I want you to know that the love of God, the incredible love of God can melt any hard heart. Romans 5, 8. This is why the Bible says that God shows his love for us. And that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I don't know about you, but that ought to amaze us. Amazing love, as we sang earlier, 
How can it be that you, my king, would die for me? That's what the thief saw as he looked uh, over and saw the king written above the cross, the king of the Jews dying there for him. Amazing love that you, my king, would die for me. And so this thief turned from his sin and he trusted in Jesus. And he did that and it's shown by him asking a question. He said, he said, Jesus, remember me. Will you remember me when you enter your kingdom? And Jesus turned to him the best he could on that cross. And he said, today you will be with me in paradise. Paradise is the the place of blessing that the righteous would go to after death. That's the way the words used in Jewish literature. Paul talked about paradise when he went up in 2 Corinthians 12. He was caught up in his heavenly vision to paradise. And so it's no question what Jesus was talking about. He said, today you'll be with me in paradise. Today you will be with me in heaven. You see, the Bible doesn't teach this idea of soul sleep, that our souls stay uh, asleep somehow until Jesus returns and our bodies are raised. No, the Bible tells us that at the moment that we take our last breath, we are in the presence of God. Absent from the body, to be present with the Lord. Today, he said, you'll be with me in paradise. This thief, this sinner was saved right there. In that moment, isn't God good? You can honk. You can honk for that. <laughs> I love it. He's, he's so good. He loves us. As we come to a close, just notice this, I, just real quickly. I just want you to notice that there was nothing that this thief on the cross could do in order to earn salvation. Nothing at all. His hands were nailed to the cross. His feet were nailed to the cross. He could not do anything to impress God or earn his salvation. All he could do is trust in the one that died right next to him. That's it. He couldn't do anything. And I also want you to notice this. Then isn't it amazing that one of the first ones, if not the first one who trusted in Christ was a thief on a cross? Isn't Jesus, isn't God through this act in history showing that the cross salvation is for anybody who would come? It does not matter what their, your past is or where you've been or what you've done. But one of the first ones to cling to that old rugged cross was nailed to a cross right next to Jesus. The eternal Son of God that day died as if he were a criminal so that the criminal could die as an adopted son of God. Listen, most of the disciples did not grasp who Jesus was at this point, but the thief did. Most of the disciples didn't get it until they saw the risen Jesus. Because just three days later, on Sunday morning, early in the morning, Jesus physically rose from the grave. And that was God's stamp saying, That was the Father's stamp upon the work of Jesus Christ saying, yes, it really is finished. Yes, this truly is the Son of God. He truly did this and he lives today. He's not a victim, he's the victor. He has won the victory over death and sin. And anyone who places their faith, who trusts in Christ, can have life. It says in Romans chapter 1, it speaks of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was a descendant of David according to the flesh 
and who has been declared to be the powerful Son of God by the resurrection from the dead according to the Spirit of holiness. The resurrection shows that all this is true. And what the thief saw even before, we have the privilege of looking back and seeing that it really is true. God raised him from the dead, and the promise of life is for anyone who believes. He died, and he paid it all. So, if there's anybody who does not know Jesus, who hasn't trusted in him, the message of the scripture is that he died for you, and he was raised so that all those who trust in him may have life. Maybe you've been a believer for years. Isn't it appropriate on a Resurrection Sunday that we just be reminded of the victory we have in Jesus? Isn't it appropriate that we be put in awe of the incredible love that God has for us? He chose that cross. And he did it for me. And he did it for you. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your love for us. I stand amazed in the presence of your son Jesus, the Nazarene. God, thank you. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for him who died for me, a sinner condemned unclean. Father, thank you, Lord, for every person here. I pray for anyone who does not know you, who has not trusted in what you've done for them. Help them to do that this morning. I thank you, Lord, for our church family. I thank you, God, that We've been able to gather here in this much different kind of way. But Lord, I pray that you would just put us all in awe of your amazing love and what you've done for us. And we thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 <laughs> wow. Church, I have to say, this is an experience I've never, never imagined I would have. This is different than any service I've ever been a part of. But man, it's so good to get to join together, even in this way, to see faces and, uh, and to hear those horn, horns honk. That's, that's wonderful. Praise the Lord. Um, listen, I'm, we're praying. And, and continue to pray that this, uh, this time will come to an end when the, Lord, when, when the Lord wills it. But I pray soon, and I know you do too, because I can't wait for us to be able to gather together in this building and worship. But it has been a good day. I want to thank and I want to invite you to also join me in thanking those who helped construct this platform and those who have made this happen. Our media team has done so much. You can honk in, in thanking them. Go for that. So there were, <laughs> there were so many who just did, uh, did a lot of work to pull it off. So it's so good. God bless. Again, uh, those tear-offs from your bulletin, if, as you drive out, if you'll just drop those in, in the, the basket, and if you would like to drop, drop an offering in there, you can do that as well. So God bless. It's so good to see you.